I'm okay, recording. Yeah. I'm doing it. Okay, welcome everyone. Okay. Uh, nice to see you. I thought there'd just be a few of us. Five is the result. Oh wait, that's including me. So cool. That's cool. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Um, this is going to be the first of hopefully lots of lectures, um, or you know meetups and things like that for so for Arduino. And I just thought it'd be fun for us to have quick gets together. Uh, talk about what we're doing um, and then people talk about the projects stuff like that and I've just really enjoyed virtual meetings um, the Raspberry Pi group in London has switched to virtual and learning in London group has switched to virtual as well and it's just been really enjoyable being able to do that in the lockdown so um, I thought we could do some as well so that could be fun um, does anyone want to do introductions or what would you like to do hands up if you want to or you know kind of unmute yourself and just say hi if you'd like to Paul, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I'll go. Uh, Paul Shelley. Uh, I've done iOS development professionally for a while and uh, played and uh, kind of had a lot of interest in microcontrollers and uh, stuff like that. And when Swift was announced, I was like, oh, this would be awesome on a microcontroller. But I was like, this is way too big of a project. Uh, maybe, hopefully, I'll find some other, you know, schmuck that has. Uh, takes it on and I'll kind of try to jump on and help a little bit. I actually met Carl at WWDC 2018, 2018 and yeah. somehow it never came up. Like we met kind of briefly because I was hanging out with some other uh, British people. So, you know, all the Brits kind of at one point pass each other. And, but then uh, I ran across the, the, I ran across some stuff like online, like a month or two, a few months later. And, uh, and I was like, wait, I, I recognize this guy. <laughs> anyway, so I've reached out and have been uh, kind of trying to help a little here and there um, with uh, the project for, I guess it's been, it's been a little bit like yeah, a so. year. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, since like 2018. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, kind of me, a little background. Cool. Does anyone else want to introduce themselves? Don't feel any obligation to do so. I'm happy to just talk. That's cool. I'm all right, Carl. You know me. Just talk. Carl, you are muted. I, I'm muted. And yeah, Andrew, Andrew I'm not you're, you're not muted, Andrew. but I can't hear anything you're in. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay, well, um, I'm Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Welcome. And uh, I know Martin. Uh, Martin's an old colleague who was together um, near the beginning of my career in iPhone, I guess, something like that. So quite a long time ago. 2011. Uh, yep. A while ago. So yeah. And welcome, Scott. Okay, so um, I'll kick off and try and get back on schedule. So. Um, what is, I mean, this is going to be a bit strange because you guys have all seen Swiss for Arduino, but since I'm recording it, this is also uh, partly talking to people who might look at this afterwards, might look recording afterwards. Uh, what is Swift for Arduino? Well, it's sort of fairly ev evident, I would guess. It's a Mac application, um, an IDE, depending on loose definitions of the term, but essentially it's a way to program using the Swift language and upload directly onto Arduino Uno and similar hardware. And it's like uh, a more compact version of the Swift language, which I'm calling Micro Swift. Um, I'll get into that just a little bit. Uh, the, the one thing that I think I want to address because it's come up so many times when I've been introducing this is why have another language for Arduino Uno? I think for people who come from an iPhone development background, it's almost a no brainer. Most people are used to working in Swift and they just think, well, yes, of course you would want to use Swift, but for people who are perhaps less familiar with Swift, what's the purpose of it? And I mean, I think this, I'll make no secret, this started just as a hobby, but as I've done it over the years, I've started to be more and more convinced that this is a good idea. And a lot of people have said the same thing as well. And I think the key thing about Swift compared to the standard languages, C, C++ and assembly, which you would use for microcontroller programming, is about predictability and safety. So it's about 
reducing undefined behavior. So you've got much less chance to accidentally have a buffer overrun or an integer conversion that you didn't expect. Now, a hardcore C programmer would say, well, you should never do that if you're an excellent C programmer. And whilst that is valid to some extent, so you could say that this only applies for new people to the language, I think that that's not 100% valid. I think that pretty much anyone who is a C or C++ programmer at some point writes undefined behavior, gets one of those obscure bugs. And I think on microcontrollers, it's particularly onerous because you can't really, you don't really have the same kind of structure that you've got in an operating system where if you start running out of bounds, you're probably going to get um, a segmentation fault and your process is going to die and you're going to think, okay, there's something wrong here and go in there with your debug tools and try and figure it out you'll just get strange behavior. And this is what happened to me when I started writing uh, programs through Arduino Uno. The first ones that I download would work really well. Then I'd modify something and run it again and it would work and then it would stop working at some point or it would work most of the time. I had like a light in the corner of my room that was running a program that just literally uh, checked for the mains voltage, when it came, did a little pulse to give basically a fader. It worked 90% of the time and then occasionally it would just kind of flicker and go nuts. It was like it was possessed or something like that. This was a one byte buffer overrun. So, and it was in network handling code. So every time a network packet came in, it was kind of just slowly eating away through the RAM and eventually it would hit something important. And this is, it wasn't even, you know, a, a really obvious mistake. This is a classic example, the sort of thing that you can get with C and C++. And I think even for experienced developers, even for experienced microcontroller programmers, this is something that could save time and save hassle and money. And particularly in the area of security flaws, I think this is something interesting and useful. So I think the two languages that are specialized on safety, Rust and Swift, actually have a future in microcontrollers. And I think we're in at the ground level in a lot of ways. Another question is, why not just put on a great big fat ARM programmer? There are some you know, machines out there where they've just got a great big machine and put an ARM uh, core in it and then throw loads of power at it. I think if you can make it work on an 8-bit microcontroller, then you're in a different league. You're actually doing proper microcontroller programming and you can build hardware devices from the ground up using Swift as a language. So I think this is an interesting challenge. That said, of course, there are some interesting problems with this. So MicroSwift is this idea that I came up with around about two years ago when the project was about a year old, I would say, and I was talking to the Apple Swift engineers at WWDC. And the big thing that they kept saying to me is, you're never gonna fit the runtime in there. Or they weren't quite as negative as that, they were just concerned. Um, and they were saying the standard library is fairly bulky. Are you sure this is going to work? And I think eventually what evolved into over about a year was me thinking at some point, I'm gonna to need to write my own version of the standard library essentially or a cut down version or cribbed version or something like that. And I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with the runtime, probably again, a very, very cut down version. And that was something that for obvious reasons I kept putting off. So, because it's quite terrifying to jump into something like that. The first three versions of Swift for Arduino just had an off the shelf uh, Swift 3.1.1 uh, um, compiler downloaded from Swift.org and that was just bundled straight into the Mac application that produced LLVMIR and then we had a custom backend that was actually producing the AVR assembly language and that was mostly the bit that I focused on was the custom backend doing bug fixes, tracing optimization problems, those sorts of things, all of which was necessary but it was hamstrung essentially by the lack of uh, not having a proper Swift front end, a proper standard library that was suitable for Arduino Uno and Eventually, earlier this year, I kind of realized it was time to bite the bullet. Coronavirus helped because I was stuck at home and I uh, picked up all the work that I'd done before about working on a custom version of the compiler and custom standard library. That is now released and live in version four of Swift for Arduino. So it has a standard library that has, for example, integer arithmetic operations will not uh, abort if they overflow, they will just wrap around. So if you add an int eight and an int eight and the overflow, which is quite easy to do. Then on standard Swift, that would immediately uh, compile down to an LLVM trap and your program would just go into an infinite loop. And that would be from someone that you don't know. There's no error handling. You're not really sure what's going on. With this now, it will just wrap around. Now, obviously there's some design 
negatives on that, but generally speaking, that seems to be the correct approach. And that's what I've done throughout the library. For example, arrays, which is one of the most recent features added in um, the library, in the, sorry, the standard library, this is what doing a standard library, are very different from arrays that you'd be used to in Swift. They, you have much more control over the memory and in both a good and a bad way. So you basically have to say, I'm creating this array, it's a fixed space in memory, but it's not going to, every time you add a, an element to it, it might not just go to the heap and pull out some more space. It'll just be like, that's your space, that's what you've got, you don't get any more. If you finish using it, you have to release it. We're gonna work on things beyond that a little bit more, but you haven't got all of the over, overhead of classes and arc. You do have heap, but it's just used for specific dy dynamic memory allocations, those sorts of things. So these are the sorts of things we're, that we're doing in the product. And I'm pretty happy with the design decisions that we've made so far. There are certainly some people who walk into this uh, will need good documentation. The number one problem with this app is the documentation is not fit for purpose yet. It really needs a lot more work, a lot more love, examples. Uh, the more examples people do, the better. That's why I love it when people get involved and say, like Scott, that, you know, I'm going to do a port on this and, you know, really get some components out there. Um, and I'm aware that I need to sit down and just bang out more documentation and try and think about what this would be like for a new user. Um, but I think that this is the basis for something that can work across a variety of microcontrollers. And so therefore is fitting an interesting new niche. Um, I think that pretty much summarizes all of things. That's a good cover of the state of the union, as it were. I'm not going to go into like more technical depth than that. You can do questions and answers at the end. Um, a little bit on roadmap. So a couple of talking points that I want to bring up. Paul, who is hosting this meeting that you saw that I was talking to earlier, who introduced himself, who's our main hardware lead, is working with me on something that we were calling the hardware abstraction layer. So what we're trying to do is make something, that the current AVR library that comes with Swift for Arduino is very much an analog of what you get on uh, the standard Arduino IDE. So it's got, it's equivalent to like the wiring library, server, maybe not servers, but let's say SPI, wire, uh, serial, those kind of classes. So it, and it just, it can do things like say, you know, pin mode and digital write and delay and stuff like that. So it's very good for beginning programming, but say you want to get in there and control certain features of the timers or ports, and you really want fine grained control, or you want to do it on a different chip, then it's gonna be challenging. So I think what we're gonna do, we're gonna keep that library, but we're also gonna build another set of libraries that'll give you low level access to registers on each of the different chips. And that's what we're calling the hardware access layer. So that's one of the key areas we want to work on. Another thing that we're looking at is around build tools and expanding things open. So one of the, the things that keeps coming up again and again is we want to, people need to link in legacy code. So they need to pull in C++ libraries, existing code, those sorts of things. Now, this comes into a bit of a compromise because there's, if you just say to people, okay, you can bang any kind of C++ code you want in there and they don't really know what they're doing and they just pull in some stuff that they found on the web, then you've introduced all of the uh, undefined behavior that you're trying to avoid with using this language. So there is a trade-off there, which I think I've been a bit aggressive against those sorts of things. I think the thing that's coming up again and again, the more people come on board, the more questions I'm asked is we're gonna to need to be more loose on this. So I think one of the things that I want to move towards in uh, version 4.1, version five, whichever it is, is something where you've got uh, much easier access to putting C++ code directly into the projects so that you can make it available to Swift. Uh, possibly as modules, it should be the ideal. So you say, go make a module and import that, but just not have to go this kind of, you can do it at the moment using this slightly circuitous route that's been available since version three, where you create um, what we call an unsafe module that goes into the community library and then you pull that down and use that. And there's a few of those on the community library that you'll see at the moment on GitHub. Um, but it's it's far too complex and basically no one ends up using this except me. No one's created them except me. So that's a clue that it's too hard. So um, I think the first thing, one of the first things I wanna do is try and make that process simpler. Um, and also going along with that, a lot of people have spoken about command line tools. I can't see a reason why not to. I mean, you know, this is a relatively expensive product now. I think people download the products, 
give them command line tools and they can do a command line build. Sure, why not? Absolutely. I think that's another great idea and there'd be another way to do that. So I think these are the features that we've got coming up um, and it's, yeah, I'm pretty excited about it generally. I think it's, it's, it's looking pretty good. Um, from a high level overview, obviously we want to get lots of people in, the more kind of custom and uh, the more um, community in particular, we get the more people who are contributing, the better it's gonna get. You know, you'll get ideas from all different stables and you'll get uh, code coming in and you'll just suddenly realize what's important and what isn't and we'll move this thing forward like anything. So um, yeah, I think that's pretty much a high level overview. Um, I'll go into, now this is something where I think all of you guys will probably know this, but again, for people who are watching the video back, um, I'm gonna talk about what a logic, logic analyzer is and how you can use one, uh, because I've rabbited on about Swift uh, for other in the state of the union. It's probably gonna be a relatively short part of the talk. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a project uh, that I've been making. So let's um, pull this around. I think, so I'm gonna to have to, this is one of those negotiations. So we're gonna show you the project that we've got here. So this is, oh, the logic analyzer is falling down. We'll have a look at that in a second. So this here is a NeoPixel strip, which is attached to the top of my cabinet. It's being driven by, you've got a reasonably hefty power supply, and this is the key kit in here. So we've got an Arduino, uh, the middle shield there is just a plug board that you can plug stuff into and the top shield is an Adafruit uh, blue fruit shield which has got a little module on there that you can see at the top which gives you Bluetooth abilities and the ones that I'm interested in primarily are just using it like a UART just sending serial data back and forth to the phone so I've got on my iPhone I've got an app written Nice looking app written using Swift UI. And hopefully, okay, live demo danger. If I change the color on this, something obvious like red, and I'll change in the background. You see, I can make it pink, those kinds of things. So I'm gonna kind of quickly go over roughly how that works. This is where I'm gonna try and do a little bit of screen sharing. And we'll see how well that goes. Oh. Also for people who are watching, you'll notice that there is a Sally Logic Analyzer there. Now I might try a live recording, but um, I've actually got one that I prepped earlier, which is probably gonna be easier just to show that, to be honest. So let's do a screen share and we'll show the code. Okay, can you guys see the code window there? Does that all look good? Yeah. That's good. Okay, cool. I might try and make this a little bit bigger. And then we'll have a brief summary of what's going on. So uh, you can see simply what this is supposed to be doing. It's supposed to receive signals on Bluetooth using UART and um, then interpret those using a protocol I invented. Um, and since I wrote the iPhone app as well, obviously I can invent that end as well. And uh, then send NeoPixel signals down. And the first thing that is worth pointing out here is the libraries up here. So when you're using Swift for Arduino, you can add libraries from the community libraries like this. You just tick the ones that you want. And we're only using one library, which is for the Blue Fruit Shield. Um, the NeoPixels, we're just writing directly using functions that are built into the AVR module. So the AVR module has standard digital write, uh, delay, all those sorts of things you see here at the clips at the top. But it's also in serial communications, I to C, SPI, um, things you'd expect. It's also got some basic NeoPixel functions built into it. Um, which most people use successfully, although we've had some complaints that with certain cheap um, NeoPixels from China, people have had some issues with it. Um, and when you bring in a library, so when you, these libraries, the community libraries are uh, brought in from GitHub. When you enable one of those, the first thing that it does is it puts the name of the file, which is just a Swift file directly into here. Most of them are just Swift. 
This one actually has some C++ uh, compiled code underneath it. And it also adds in any snippets that are created. So the snippets for the Adafruit Bluefruit Shield will allow you to do things like uh, set the name of the device, uh, set the mode that you want to use and stuff like that. So you can drag these snippets in or you can look at example code from hub sites, et cetera. Um, we'll do a brief description of how the program works and then I'll quickly show you uh, a trace that I captured just before this um, for uh, to sort of show how you might interpret data using a, a logic analyzer. So in order to make this thing turn off and on a ball, you pull out the existing values from the EEPROM and essentially the protocol is here. So this is interpret command. It gets a set of data that comes down from the iPhone. That data will be basically just a hue and a value. And it's just like the letter H and then the hue and then the letter V and then the value. And that's how it knows how bright to make the near pixels and what color to make them. And it just interprets them in here. You can look at this code offline. I'll send the code around afterwards so people can have a look and uh, poke through it. Uh, the new feature that I've added is fading in, fading out, and then it writes things to the EEPROM when you've finished interpreting a hue or value, so that next time you restart the program, it stays at the same color. So you don't have to kind of, every time you turn the power off and on again, have to go back in, get the iPhone up out and change it to the color the, or the brightness that you want. Uh, down here, we've got the near pixel set up and we're showing a solid color to begin with. And this is the Bluetooth uh, interpretation here. So this is setting up the Bluetooth to wait for the iPhone to connect and then in a loop, just wait for commands to come from the iPhone and interpret them. And then, you know, just a little delay in here to make sure that it doesn't overwhelm essentially just so that it's a little bit more responsive as such those kind of things. Um, and now I will flip to, let's see, I'm trying to figure out how to screen share the logic analyzer. I think I have to stop this one and start a new screen share. Okay, let's try this. Share screen logic analyzer. Okay. Here's the logic analyzer. So, I've got uh, three pins connected, which is the clock pin, the MISO and MOSI pin. If you know anything about SPI, uh, these are the three of the four core pins. You've also got a uh, select pin often, um, but you can look it up where to attach these. I just attach them to the relevant pins, which is the standard Arduino pins for these three on the protocol. And then I attached one at the top, one wire at the top to the NeoPixel signal that was coming out. And the protocol seems to be quite chatty. So it's like uh, the way the Adafruit uh, Bluefruit Shield works, it uses SPI to send essentially uh, serial commands between the Bluefruit Shield and the um, Arduino board. And it's a slightly unusual protocol. You would expect them to use TX and RX, but you, you can configure it to do that if you want, but this is the standard way of doing it. Um, I won't go into detail on the protocol. You can look it up in Bluefruit's, uh, in Adafruit's documentation because it is quite detailed. But the key thing that you see is a logic analyzer is essentially like a kind of an oscilloscope that has multiple pins and each of them only records digital levels, high and low. So because it's done that, it can record a lot more data and it can be in a much simpler device. And it means you can have data over an extended period of time. And most importantly, you can see the pins against each other. So you can see, for example, you've got clock pins running here. And if we zoom in, which I do just by sort of scrolling down like that, you can see that it's interpreting this. So you need to tell it that you need to add and analyze, very straightforward to do, you just like notice there you say which pin is attached to which one. It can say because these clock pins have gone on this time and because MISO goes up at this point, it can interpret for you that that is uh, a signal going out of 255 on MOSI and coming in on MISO. It's, I think that's probably a space. I could have a look and change it. I'm gonna, to keep things short, I won't go into excessive details there. But the key point is you can see the commands coming and going. When I debug this thing, so I actually carefully sat down and watched what all the commands were that were going. And then finally, 
afterwards, you see NeoPixel data going out. There's no interpreter for this because this is um, a sort of custom protocol that's been invented by the inventors of these NeoPixel chips. And basically you can see the standard NeoPixel signals that are thin and fat pulses representing zero and one going down to the device. Um, and I think that pretty much summarizes it. Any more than that, I think we'll probably take in q and I'm not gonna risk trying to do a capture live now because the, the wire's not working and all of those kinds of things. Um, that's about it. Let's call that to a stop. Um, does anyone have any questions that would like to ask about either that project or Swift for Arduino? Hey, Carl. Hey. Yeah, so you kind of answered a lot of my questions already during your introduction because I don't know if, uh, I think we talked about this project of yours maybe a year ago or so, I don't know. I might have told you that I'm working on some music hardware now, which then in turn connect via Bluetooth to iOS slash Android slash whatever application. Just stop the recording actually because you don't need to be recorded. <laughs> no, I don't need to be.